Viewer discretion is advised. Indianapolis 500, the greatest spectacle in racing, the racing capital of the world in Speedway, Indiana. Every Memorial Day, except 2020, which is postponed to August 23rd due to the coronavirus pandemic, we get to witness 33 of the greatest drivers duking it out for the next 200 laps and 500 miles of the famed two and a half mile speedway at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There has been a lot of iconic moments, great moments, heartbreaks, and unfortunately, tragic moments. If you ask me, what is the most tragic moment in Indy 500 history? My answer is the 1973 month of May. Here is the story of the 1973 Indianapolis 500, a tragic month of May. Going into the month, the mood was bright and excitement was high for record speeds. Competitors, medias, and fans were eagerly anticipating the possibility of breaking the elusive and daunting 200 miles per hour barrier during time trials. However, the excitement took a turn for the worse. When death comes calling, he rarely leaves empty handed. This driver will probably never come closer to that last indescribable moment of reckoning than he did on this day. Unbelievably, he walks away. But death is still close. And one man meets him face to face. On May 12, 1973, Art Pollard was killed in practice during the first day of time trials. The car clipped the wall coming out of turn 1 in a half spin as it headed to the grass on the inside of the short chute. The chassis dug into the grass and flipped upside down, slid a short distance and then flipped back over as it reached the pavement again in turn number 2. Finally coming to a stop in the middle of the track, the total distance cover was 1450 feet, 440 meters. The car was demolished, the impact tore off two wheels immediately, and the wings were also torn off during the slide. Pilot's lap prior to the crash was timed at a speed of 192 plus miles per hour. Pilot was rushed to the Methodist Hospital in a new cardiac ambulance. His injuries were reported to include pulmonary damage due to flame inhalations, burns on both hands, face, and neck, and a broken arm. He was 46 years old. He turned 46 a week before his death. Later that same day, Johnny Rutherford set a new track record during time trials. His best lap was 199.071 miles per hour. He was so close to beat that 200 miles per hour barrier. However, despite the headlines about pole day, nobody was focusing on that. The mood around the garage area was becoming anxious and uncertain. Fears were growing about rising speeds and safety. Not only that, the concern about the race was on a rise as well. Why? Because weather will also be a factor. Originally, the 57th annual race was supposed to be scheduled on Saturday, May 26th to start the race. However, because of rain and the tracks never on a Sunday policy, the race was moved on Monday, May 28th. After a two-day wait at Indianapolis, it was finally race day. We got Jim McKay, Jackie Stewart, and Chris Ikanamaki who are calling the shots on ABC for the 57th annual Indianapolis 500. It was business as usual like every other Indianapolis 500 race, 350,000 fans in her seats, the hype is real. You got the great Jim Neighbors singing back home again in Indiana as an Indy 500 tradition. And finally, the most famous words in motorsports from track president, Tony Holman. The energy was building up as the 33 drivers start their engines, warm up their tires during pace laps, and after three pace laps, it was time to go racing at Indianapolis. 
Jim Rathman took the Cadillac Eldorado on pit road and the race was underway. Which was something I would say, but unfortunately, the race started off with a fiery wreck. The green, that'll be it, the base car coming off. Jim Rathman takes the base car off the track. He should get the green right now. Doesn't look like a repeat of last year's start. No, it's a good one. And here they come. Bobby Unser going for the lead. Johnny Rutherford right alongside him. Rutherford down low, but Bobby puts a goal of a crash on the home stretch. There are several cars and cars. We can't see the numbers, but it's been a bad crash on the start. The 11 car accident took place on a main stretch where Steve Krisloff's car developed ignition problems and slowed on the front stretch. Krisloff shuffled towards the outside to avoid slowing cars. On the sixth row, Saltwater tangled wheels with Jerry Grant, climbed over Grant's left front wheel, overturned the air, and slammed into the catch fence. The car cut a 70-foot chunk out of the fence on impact before being thrown back onto the track by reinforcing cables behind the fence. The impact ripped open Walther's fuel tank, sending burning fuel into the stands and dousing many spectators. 11 fans were injured and none of them required hospitalization. After Walther's impact and a nose being sheared off, Walther's legs were exposed and was upside down and spun wildly down the main stretch. Walther's car came to a rest upside down near the pit exit. Walther suffered severe burns and injuries to his hands. As you can see here in this picture, Salt Walther is the one with the number 77. His legs exposed upside down. He had the worst of it. And let's just say that the crash affected Saltwater's life. And speaking of salt, the next episode of Racing Stories will be about the life of Saltwater, how the crash has affected him and his personal life. And let's just say, everything about Saltwater, it's important and interesting. And I will be doing a story about salt in the next episode of Racing Stories. I hope you guys tune into that soon. While the cleanup was going on and almost finished, rain became a factor and it washed out the rest of the day. The race was rescheduled for Tuesday at 9 a.m. On Tuesday, the sky was reported to look clear, but rain fell once again in the morning hours, which meant the race was delayed yet again. Officials announced that the race will be restarted, which meant the drivers who were in the crash get the chance to do repairs, so 32 of the 33 drivers can compete for the race. While the race is delayed, there was a meeting going on, and let's just say, it was not a pretty one. Well, it was a stormy meeting of gigantic proportions. All the drivers in there with USAC officials, along with Indianapolis Motor Speedway officials, we get it on unimpeachable authority. That one of the drivers stood up and said, look, if you don't shape up the start of this race, you're going to get us all killed out there. There were obscenities, name calling, you name it. A big stormy session, no threat of a boycott. And I asked one of the drivers when he got out of the meeting, what in the world can you do about it? And he said, really nothing. He said, but you'd think that they could start this race successfully. He said, after all, they have only one race a year and they have the rest of the year to prepare for it. And they managed to follow it up almost every year. And he said, our lives are the ones that are on the line. Now, what they have done now is to say that we will not start the race at 80 miles an hour. They were supposed to start it at 80 yesterday. And all the drivers have told me the same thing. There is no possible way that we were going 80 miles an hour. And we had to accelerate too quickly and thus increasing the danger. So this time, the pace car will be driven at at least 100 miles an hour to ensure a little safer start. And hopefully, it will get better. But right now, the atmosphere between the drivers and Speedway officials is anything but friendly. Now back upstairs. After the meeting, they restarted their engines. After the second pace lap, rain was a factor again. And at 1.48, the race was postponed yet again to the next day. On Wednesday, May 30th, it was threatened by morning rain yet again to wash out the race for the third day in a row. Attendance has gotten lower and lower from the past three days. The entire racetrack of the property, it's a mess. 
because of the weather. It's all over the place. Parking lots were flooded, and the IMS snake pit was described as a hog. Unlike the past two days, the mood around the garage was glum. Crews were exhausted. Drivers were apprehensive. It was now the longest rain delay in Indianapolis 500 history. It was so long, it was given the nickname the 72 Hours of Indianapolis, referring to the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The cars had sat mostly idle for the past day, except for Carb Day, which means there were separate concerns about potential mechanics and handling problems. Because of the rain delays, USAC elected to postpone the next race at Milwaukee from June 3rd to June 10th of 1973. The May 30th scheduled start time of the race was 9 a.m. However, they waited five more hours for the track surface to dry. At 2.10 p.m., the track was dry enough to finally go racing. Finally, for the second time, Tony Holman says the most famous words in motorsports again. Thirty-two USAC turbines came to life again at Indianapolis. Before the race got restarted, David Hobbs' car began to smoke heavily. However, Hobbs did rejoin the race. Thankfully, the race was underway with a better start. It was business as usual like any other Indy 500. The first 45 laps only had two cautions for Bob Harkey's engine blown and spinning and Joe Leonard's spin. Then on lap 57... Tragedy struck. There's Hunter. It looks like he's going to make a pit stop. That could give Savage the lead again. Uh, yeah, yes, he is. Oh, my God, it's Savage! Oh! What a crash. God, almighty. The worst thing I've ever seen. Savage. That is the worst oh. thing I've ever seen. Four, four, four. Race course anywhere. Tire. One tire must have flown 100 feet in the air. I think he's in the, the one to the right. I can't even tell what part... Each part of the car is just disintegrated. The red flag, of course, is at the race is stopped. Sweet Savage is moving inside that thing. The fire there. Now, Sweet is wearing, he is wearing one of these new suits where the foam automatically goes off inside the suit. Only four drivers of the race are wearing it. He is wearing it. If there's any hope, it, it might be in that. Well, how it could be moving, Jim, is beyond me. I've never seen a car just disintegrate like that. Uh, you remember he made a pit stop just a little bit ago. The cars hold 75 gallons of fuel, and he hadn't burned much of that off. The race is... Oh, uh, uh, somebody's been hit in the pit. A fire truck, a fire truck racing to the scene has hit a mechanic or somebody in the pit. who's going the wrong way through the pit. They're trying to get Savage out of the car. The man was thrown in the air. Hit by a fire truck. 26-year-old Sweet Savage lost control of his car as he exited turn 4. The force of the impact was so hard the 70 gallon, 500 pounds of methanol fuel caused the crash to explode while the car was flipping and tumbling at the front stretch, blocking the way thanks to a lot of debris. The red flag came out immediately and the track safety members immediately ran to the accident. While safety crews are racing towards Sweet Savage, 22-year-old Armando Tehran, who was a mechanic of the third Patrick Racing SDP car, was struck by a fire truck while racing to the scene. Jerry Flake's truck struck Tehran. Tehran's body was tossed about 50 feet in the air, an impact so violent it was violent enough to knock him out of his shoes. George Bignotti, who was Gordon Johncock's chief mechanic, who recalls the incident, saying, quote, I heard the car come and then, whop, it hit him. The incident was seen by thousands of spectators as it occurred on pit road at the start-finish line. Armando Tehran suffered crushed ribs and a broken skull. Tehran did live through the impact. After he was transported to the hospital, Tehran would shortly die at the Methodist Hospital. 33 days after the terrifying accident, on July 2, 1973, Sweet Savage would pass away in the hospital from complications arising from his injuries and treatment. Savage's cause of death was never fully explained. Report says that he died of lung failure. However, CART Medical Director Dr. Steve Ovey, who explained his autobiography Rapid Responses, that the cause of death was an infection of hepatitis B from containment plasma. Ovey was given the most credible explanation. As for Swede, he was going to be a father to a baby girl named Angela Renee Savage. As of the Speed Sport article from 2014, Angela lives in Boulder City, Nevada, She's married and has two kids named Chance and Cruz. 
After an hour and 11 minute red flag, the race was underway with Alonso leading. After over 50 laps of racing and blown engines from Jimmy Carruthers, who actually had a tire down, and Alonso Sr., who was a contender leading the race, he blew up as well. Rain became to fall on lap 129, and a caution was out while Gordon Johncock was leading. On lap 133, it rained even harder, and the race was stopped. A short time later, Gordon Johncock was declared the 1973 Indianapolis 500 champion after leading the most laps of 64 of the 133 laps. The 1973 Indy 500 was the shortest 500 on record at the time with 332.5 miles until the 1976 Indy 500, which was halted even shorter distance of 255 miles. The victory celebration was muted and a banquet was canceled. John Cock left the track soon after the race to visit Swede Savage. Gordon John Cock and team owner Pat Patrick ended the day and had a victory dinner at Burger Chef. After the 1973 race, the Never on a Sunday policy was lifted and the pit wall entrance was renovated. Hey everybody, if you made it this far into this episode, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching this video. I will admit that I am not a perfect video story writer. I do this so other fans can learn the history of motorsports. If I left out something about the race, or if you attended the race, feel free to leave your stories in the comments below. Feel free to tell me what happened that I missed. A lot of help would be amazing. Extra help would be awesome. Thank you. Now back to the remainder of this episode. Although life goes on, and the disaster of the 1973 race was in the past, there are fans who attended the race still remember that faithful month of May. Even drivers and owners and other people of the series who remember that race. In 2013, Pat Patrick says, quote, Very sad, about as sad as you get, I still feel bad about it. CEO and affable pitchman of STP, Andy Granatelli recalls the month of May of 73, quote, To me, it was a horrible year, terrible and empty. Art Pollard and Swede Savage are the two of the 56 drivers who passed away from Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and Savage was the last driver to pass away at an Indy 500 race. Some people say the 1973 was the worst 500 race in history. Others say it was a disastrous month of May. If you ask me, the 1973 Indianapolis month of May was a tragic month of May. May Art Pollard, Armando Turan, and Swede Savage rest in peace. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Racing Stories. Comment, like, and subscribe for more episodes, and I will do more whenever I can. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye, everybody.